the individual call types or the individual species, but rather to look at it as, a, as a, its own entity. So how are we looking at a loud soundscape? Are we looking at a soundscape that has lots of different frequencies at lots of different types of sound? How much is that uh, soundscape changing over time, for example? So it's those kind of properties we can get through these whole soundscape assessments versus uh, individual species. Um, okay, so that was sort of a quick introduction into acoustics, and now we're gonna have a look at machine learning. Um, in it, at its heart, machine learning is an sort of a black box of uh, mystery intelligence. All it is is optimized algorithms that, well, in some cases, that can be used to sort information and classify information, or at least that's the way that we're gonna use it here. Um, they're just, they're just often trained on huge amounts of data and run and optimize over thousands of iterations that make them actually very powerful at picking out the key descriptors and separators in, uh, in information. So this is an example, and this is super basic. I'm sorry if there's any like machine learning people in, but this is just an example of how we can say that an algorithm has learned something. So say you've got these two things that you're wanting to classify, and you're wanting to build a machine learning classifier that can, look, that can determine whether something is a reptile or a mammal. And the only information you have is whether or not it has fur. And this is your training data set. This is all of the labeled data that you have. So we're going super basic. So you set up your algorithm like this. The only information, you, the only question you can ask is, does it have fur? And when you start, when you start building a machine learning algorithm, the way that it all connects is kind of random. So say, when we set it up, we've not put any data in yet. This is this is how it comes out, or like how it, the start point. And the way that we teach machine learning algorithms, or the way that they learn, is we test them with our labeled data. So in this case, we'd take our lizard and we'd ask, does it have fur? And it would get classified as a mammal. And then we'd do that same thing with the cat and it would get classified as a reptile. But what's really important when, we can, when we're doing machine learning is we then assess how well that model's worked. So in our case, both of those were classified wrong. We'd say that model has an accuracy of zero. So then what happens it, as a machine learns is these pipes and the way they all connect changes a little bit. So again, we test it. So the lizard comes, gets classified as a mammal and the cat also as a mammal. And this time when we do our model assessment, we see that we've now got 50% of those categor categories classified correctly. And then so we'll change the model again, but keep that, that change. And then this time we manage to classify everything. So it's all classified 100% correctly. So what we can say here is that over the process of these three iterations, this algorithm, we'll call it, has learned to classify what is a mammal and what is a reptile. And what happens then is when we show it something that uh, we don't know what it is, or we haven't got any information about that on, we can ask, does it have fur? And then it gives us a prediction of whether or not it's a mammal. And this is a super stripped down basic version, but that's basically the process that a machine learning algorithm goes through to be able to classify data or particular types of machine learning algorithm. They get a little more, bit more complex, and this is just to show you a bit about the kind of algorithms that we use in acoustic research. So we have our input, so in our case, that would be a spectrogram, those picture, those images of sound that I showed you earlier, and the actual data that goes into the algorithm are just the values of the pixels. And then rather than it asking questions, you know, does it have fur or whatever, what we actually show it, um, these are different just like weighted and thresholded pipes through the, uh, through the algorithm uh, that, that are all alterated. So rather than just switching where the pipes go to, we put, as the algorithm learns, different weights and connections happen through this process, and then you end up with an output layer, which is essentially just a long string of numbers that we can then use to classify um, what the sound is. So we take this output later, and then if it's been trained sufficiently, we can pull out some classification based off of that data. So in ecoacoustics, what we do is we have these algorithms that have been trained on enormous amounts of labeled soundscape data. So what the algorithms have been shown is loads of those images and loads of labels saying, you know, that's a cricket, that's a pig, that's a monkey, for example. Um, and basically it means that we can show the algorithm sounds and pictures of sounds that it hasn't seen, and then it, we can infer or guess what that animal actually is. So humans never actually have to listen to the sound. We can do the classification through the algorithm, and you end up with 
classifications that pull out you know, those individual signatures or signals. Um, we can also have a look at data that, so if we've not got enough labeled data, so this works really well in places like the UK and in America where there's tons of labeled data. We have huge databases, thousands of clips of sounds that say, you know, this is a wren, this is a parrot, this is whatever, whereas in places like, for example, Africa, South America, a little bit here, there's not really that access to that wealth of data. There's a little bit, but not very much. So what we do instead is we use that same network, that same network that's been trained on um, all of those audio signals. And rather than using the classification, we run it through the same way. We use this output layer. And that's basically just a string of numbers. It doesn't really mean anything on its own, but we can use it as like a fingerprint, as like a generalized descriptor of what that sound is. And um, from there we can, oh yeah, so this is the model that we actually used. It's basically trained on two million YouTube clips and it's, it's been going for quite a long time now. And from there, using just those fingerprints, we can cluster those fingerprints based on their values. And what we can do is actually pull out um, different spatial differences. So these, these are just audio clips that have just been run through a model. They've not been labeled at all. And already we're seeing these clusters form in the data and that data starting to separate out. Similarly, you can see how the soundscape changes over the course of the day. So what we find is that these signals are actually very descriptive. Um, and yeah, so that's, that was kind of where, where we were at with um, these generalized features. Uh, one of the big problems we have in acoustics is it generates a huge amount of data. So as you're recording, you're generating gigabytes and terabytes of data as time goes on. And quite often what people do, particularly if we're looking at studies across the globe, is that they'll like compress that data or they'll do sort of like alterations to the data. So what I wanted to do was basically look at whether that was impacting the way that these soundscapes could be represented. Um, and I'll speed up through this, but this is basically what compression looks like. So MP3 compression, which you have in like most audio files, what you do is you maintain the general shape of the audio, but you lose quite a lot of information. And um, I'll go through this quite quickly, but basically I compared how compression affects standard indices to the machine learning based indices. So, um, what we can see here, so this is comparing uncompressed to compressed audio. What we see is that at the audio sets, so this is our machine learning one, the top one, there's no impact on those indices at all until you get these really high levels of compression. So on the right hand side is where we've like lost a lot of that data. But we can see the audio set is actually incredibly robust. The machine learning algorithm is incredibly robust to any impact of compression. And similarly, these are two other indices that um, also are quite robust, but in other cases you have quite extreme changes can happen quite quickly. So we're getting up to like 300% differences pretty fast. Uh, we then also found that if we do that like clustering that I showed you earlier, that the audio set, the machine learning based way of doing that consistently outperforms any other methods we've got for appraising whole soundscapes. And that it's again, much more robust to any differences in things like file size or compression. So basically it's, this is just to say that this stuff at the moment works really well. There's a lot of caveats to how and when you should use it, but what we're finding consistently is that we can, we can use it to uh, a pretty high degree of confidence and on, generally speaking, pretty poor data. And we wrote some guidelines on how to use that as a result. Uh, so that's just sort of a summary of how we use machine learning in, in ecoacoustics. So the next thing we looked at was Spatial acoustics. Now, this is going. This is based off of uh, VR uh, gaming, essentially. So, I, my lab at Imperial was a virtual reality uh, lab. So, they work a lot with, yeah, VR games, VR experiences, stuff like that. And they work a lot around spatial sound. So, when you're outside in the world and you hear, for example, the sound of a bird, you're you sort of instinctively know where that's come from because of the comparison that your brain is making on the signals that reach each of your ears. So that bird makes a noise. What we find is that there's a difference in the time it takes that signal to hit your ears. And there's also a difference in the loudness of that signal as it e hits each one of your ears. And what we can do is we can sub out a person and then instead put in two microphones to do that same thing. So using arrays of microphones, so more than one microphone, we're able to work out where exactly sounds have come from. 
So rather than say we're looking back at our ecosystem, rather than just knowing what's there, we can also work out where it is. And in doing that, we are able to count species, we're able to look at how they move, their, move through their uh, environments, what parts of environments they're using or perhaps not using, how they interact with each other and stuff like that. So that was, oh yeah, so that you can do it through two ways. You either have an array of microphones and then you're looking at where an organism is within that array, or you do it as like a direction of arrival, so you have a small uh, area of microphones and then you work out where the organism has come from in relation to that device. So what we did is we took a Raspberry Pi, which is just a small computer. We added a renewable energy source to it. In our case, we use solar power. And then we connected that to the cloud in the same way that your phone connects to uh, the internet. And we put a microphone on it and added this array. So what we have now is this fully networked multi-channel recorder uh, and this was just sort of the development process I went through until we landed on this array here. Uh, and yeah, so once we had the array, we were able to, to develop a housing for it, which this was my pretty st like sellotape together version. And then we have now like a fully 3D printed resin cast uh, deployment regime for it. So this device, what's really important and what I think is quite cool about it is this device can last in the field without any human interaction at all. So you can put the recorder out, it's, it charges from the sun and it uploads that data for you. So you basically it's hands off from the moment you put it out, which is fantastic for not having to send people into the field every single day to go and collect data. And we get this pretty much real time stream of data, acoustic data coming from the field. So the first, one of the first steps we did was we checked that it worked and we found that this setup, so that little array in the middle, that we could uh, localize so work out where, predict where that sound had come from to within plus or minus 10 degrees accuracy, which is pretty good. And we have now deployed it in four locations. So there's, we had it out in tropical rainforest in Brazil for a month, and it's been out six months in the UK and then various other deployments around London, essentially. Um, this, what we've done at this point is we show that it can record from multiple, multiple channels well, that we can use it to localize sound and that it works well in the field, which as a technical standpoint is like a pretty good achievement. We were quite happy with that, but at this point we didn't know that it actually was in any way useful. So the next step was to see is like, can we use this to monitor ecosystems and help us understand a little bit more about how ecosystems work? So that deployment happened, that was the six month deployment. So we had ancient woodland, which is our natural forest in the UK. So what we've got is we have like quite large trees, but we also have shrubs of different height and it's quite varied uh, within that, yeah, within a, uh, a space. And we have conifer plantation, which are these big tall timber trees and it's a complete monoculture. So we put out recorders in both ancient woodland and this monoculture and we wanted to see if organisms were using their space differently in those two different environments. So this was the pipeline we did to, uh, to basically analyze it. So the heart bird does all the localization and the bird, this is bird net. That's a machine learning based classifier. So from this acoustic data we get from the field, we get not only where a sound has come from, but we get what species it is as well. And this is all using advances in tech that weren't originally designed for ecosystem monitoring. And this is basically what we found. So each dot is a bird call and they're colored by what species they are. And then you have the locations in relation to the device. So up the top here, that's when birds are calling from like high up in the canopy. Then you have the sort of mid canopy and then where we've got birds calling from below. And what we immediately see is that in the ancient woodland, you've got way more different types of bird. And also they're using a much wider range of area. So at first we wanted to have a look at whether we could use this data to count how many species there were. So at the moment in acoustics, if you've only got one channel, if you hear five calls, you don't know if that's a single bird calling five times or whether you've got two or three birds that are all calling one or two times each. And that's really important for estimating how many of an individual there are. So what we did is we built a uh, stepwise sort of clustering algorithm or clustering process pipeline that was able to cluster those localizations and work out how many calling species there were. And not only that, how many, each, how many times each individual had called over a 20 minute period. 
So from that, we were able to look at how noisy certain birds were compared to others. So what we have is woodpeckers, magpies, parakeets, all call really quite a lot. So we have, um, yeah, generally like four or five times in a minute. And something like a buzzard or a willow tit only calls once. And that basically gives us information about how we can, um, when we use just single channel audio, we get an idea of how to oversample or undersample based on how likely it is that we'll hear that bird. That's kind of one of the ideas we were hoping for. And then the other one was to have a look at how they actually use their space. So we classified the, uh, the vertical area into upper canopy, mid canopy, and understory. And this is basically every single bird call we, det we detected. I think this was over a week period. And what you can see, it's not super obvious at first, but all of the, in the conifer plantation, so the red square is the median height or the median calling height or lo location. And you see in the conifer plantation, every single one of those medians, excluding this one, are all within that mid canopy range. Whereas in your, when you're looking at the natural forest, we find that it's actually much more spread and we have some calling from the upper canopy, some calling from the lower canopy, and we've got much more use of vertical space. So to have a look at that in terms of actual species, what we can see is that there's just a larger, a larger vari variety of vertical space usage as a result of, um, as a, yeah, as a result of where these birds are being found. So this is just looking at also how these birds spend their time. And the basically only take home point here is that like, again, not even just looking at the medians, we've got that in the conifer plantation, most birds are spending most of their time in that mid canopy, whereas the uh, behavior in natural forest is much more spread across. And we can use this as a kind of argument for diversifying the height um, profiles of conifer plantations. If we have some more lower bush, for example, perhaps we'll be able to encourage species that call at lower heights uh, more into these areas. And this is, I would say, stuff that we know about environments and ecosystems. But what's been really cool is that we've been able to show that and explore it through the device uh, that we developed. So yeah, that's a summary of, of that work. And then, yeah, so that is that's a sort of an overall summary of the work that I did for my PhD and basically how we can look at these tech advances and look at things that feel quite distinct and then bring them in to help us advance how we can look at natural ecosystems. Um, so quickly as a summary of where I came from, um, I was born in London and went to university in Exeter. So all of my university has been in the UK and when I was very little I just really liked aliens for some reason. That was what I wanted to study, like life on other planets. But when I went to university, I kind of realized that life on this planet is kind of in a struggling. So perhaps that's where I should shift my view to, or my research focus. So I started working with different study organisms, started working with different sort of social enterprises. And then I started my PhD, which was looking at how we can build these systems to monitor ecosystems. And that was really where I engaged with the more technical side of stuff, where I started learning to code a little bit more, engaging with the machine learning elements, and also dealing with um, tropical field work. Uh, so I then in 2022, I finished my PhD, and I've just started my postdoc at Cambridge, where we're now looking at applying that tech to monitoring ecosystems for uh, sustainable agriculture. But also, I just kind of wanted to say as a caveat, as a result of the work that I've done through university, I've been sent all over the world to do different things, um, resulting in me being here with you guys today. And it's really, those are, those are kind of opportunities I wouldn't have had without being able to do this. So it's, it's been a really great process for me. Um, these are the other people that were involved in that project and my details if you want to talk about any research or how we can use that data at all. All right, Terry McCaffrey. Oke, okay, terima kasih banyak Ibu Becky, luar biasa ya. Uh, gimana nih kesan-kesannya? So I'm, I'm switching Indonesian and, and uh, English ya. Um, kalau ada pertanyaan, mau bertanya bahasa Indonesia juga oke, okay, mau nanya bahasa Inggris juga oke, okay, tapi mungkin apa ya take home message-nya ya. Well, first of all, dari kecil memang senang dengan alien tadi ya, tertarik dengan alien. Uh, kemudian memang sangat cinta dengan lingkungan ya, dan ternyata dia tuh jago ini ya, ngutak ngutik ya. Jadi bio engineer suka ngutak-ngutik, kemudian bisa memadukan itu, makanya tadi interdisiplin. Kalau kita kan di sini basically bisa dikatakan monodisiplin ya, entomologi gitu. So, 
Um, I'm just encouraging them to ask questions. And uh, as I said, it's, it's very amazing to, to learn from you, from, from your background, and also the interdisciplinarity that uh, we don't see quite a lot. Um, one, one of the questions that came to my mind when I hear your presentation is that y you said that it can accurately measure abundance also. So that means the machine can discern between individual voices of birds, for instance. Is, is that what's going on? So, yeah. So at the moment, the, the abundance estimation that we're working on is just looking at where they are spatially. So if, if there's two calls coming from the same direction, even if they aren't individuals at present, they will be counted as one individual. But there are people who are working on building algorithms, machine learning algorithms, to pick out individual voices. So that work is ongoing and I think will be incredibly impactful in the future, but we're not quite, not quite there yet. Wow, I mean, for me, that's already amazing. <laughs> so, kalau ada pertanyaan, silahkan. Anyone? Jangan malu-malu. Ya, Pak Jerin. Yeah, no, those are both really great questions. So that's actually one of the things that we can do with the spatial recording device that we can't do with a single recording device. So I didn't talk about this too much, but there's a thing, there's a process in spatial audio, audio called beamforming, where by messing around with the delays between the microphones, you can amplify sounds from just certain directions. So using a spatial recorder, we could focus, for example, on only listening to this side of the room versus that side of the room, which is really amazing for noisy environments. So if you're right by the sea, for example, you could diminish how much sound that you get from the sea and instead focus on sounds on the bank or perhaps in cities and stuff like that. So that is another really excellent application of this kind of uh, audio. And then your other question about mimics is a fantastic question and one that we don't have the answer to yet. Um, at best, we're just trying to like understand yeah, get an idea of proxies, but that is that is in fact a big challenge and is something that people are talking about um, quite often. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you for the question, Fajrin. And the lagi? Yes, Doreen. Um, just to follow up, actually, on the mimicking, uh, is the pipeline as well sensitive for different calls in seasonality? Because probably like different birds will have different calls during breeding season or mm -hmm. something. How do you count for that? Yeah, so that, that all comes into the training data. And if we have that, if that information is available in the training data, the algorithm can also, will be able to pick that up. So if you have training data from all of those seasons, it will be classified as the same organism in theory. Uh, or there'll be multiple classifications, so you, it would classify as, you know, like Eurasian wren summer versus Eurasian wren winter. So it, it, for that kind of thing, it's all based on the training data, but yeah, that is absolutely a part of it. So the device you created, mm -hmm. was it actually directional or hyperbolic? Because I feel like it's a merge of both. So my, the device that we developed is uh, directional. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, so the... Hyperbolic recorders, you generally have one microphone spaced out over huge, like, large environments. Whereas the recorder we built is just one single device that you can just, like, put on a wall and it will do that localization. What w is really cool about the device is that it's time synced from the internet, which means you can pair it up with other devices and you can combine the directions to do, like, hyperbolic measurement as well. But How many devices did you have out there for when you did the two forests in the UK? The two uh, types? We, so we had two recorders in each. So, yeah, so four recorders total. Thank you. Uh, so I'm also curious about the starting uh, training uh, data. Yeah. Like how much data do you want or do you need to yeah. get accuracy with your recognition? Yeah, 
It's a great question, and the answer is it really depends. So if you are looking at quite a simple task, for example, if you wanted to classify something that is, whether it's a city or whether it's a natural forest, you probably wouldn't need that much. You just, if just enough to sort of cover overall trends. But when you end up with loads of different classes, say you've got 500 species, you're going to want probably a good, maybe 1,000 maybe per species. But then what, what we can do as well is uh, we can take raw audio recordings. So say you've got 100 recordings of a particular bird and you want to use that to train an algorithm. You can augment that data as well. So artificially, we can like stretch the spectrogram, squish the spectrogram, add in noise, take away noise. We can, we can artificially make that sound different to inflate the numbers of recordings so that the, the algorithm becomes robust to those kind of changes. So that's something that people do as well. But in terms of like raw audio data, you, you do need quite a lot, which is why it's quite a challenge in areas where we don't have that data available. I have two questions, actually. The first is, uh, is it possible to say that we can record uh, an audible, for example, above uh, 20 kilohertz, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, ultrasound or something like that? Because some animal probably has uh, an audible sound above 20 yeah. kilohertz. Uh, and the second question is uh, how to remove the noise. Mm -hmm. So is it possible uh, to remove noise? Because uh, probably noise also can be recorded as uh, frequency too, yes, yeah, or no. audible frequency. So yeah. I think that can interfere in the result. So. Yeah, no, you're yeah, you're absolutely right. So the mm -hmm. first question about sound that is beyond what we can hear, the answer to that is yes, and people do that very frequently. In fact, a lot of the ecoacoustic research that we use is all based on stuff that's ultrasonic. So for human hearing, we can hear twenty thousand hertz. So that's uh, yeah, we need to record 40,000 times per second, so 40,000 recordings per second to get a representation of that sound. We have recorders that can go up to, up to I think it's up to now about 300,000 samples per second. So in, in, a, in a second, that recorder takes 300,000 samples, and then we can get really broad spectrum appraisals of, for example, bat calls or small mammals particularly we call, that call up there. But what's really handy about doing ultrasonic recording is not mu there's not much noise in the ultrasound domain. So like, actually working with ultrasound is a bit easier in some ways than working with audible sound. But yeah, people do that quite a lot. And the other question about noise is there's, there's a lot of ways of doing it. Um, some people use machine learning approaches. Other people use more, I won't try and find it, uh, more analytical approaches. So you take your spectrogram and you find an area that you deem as silent and then you create from that silent area a noise profile, which is a profile of what the energy is when there's no, no sound that you're looking for. And then you can basically subtract that energy from the rest of the sound, and that sort of cleans it up a little bit. And yeah, that, yeah but those techniques are all being developed as well. But yeah, I th I'd say that's the two main branches of doing it. Menanya uh, apapun, Itu ya bisa ya, nggak harus hanya tentang ini ya. Any question? Ya, yeah. Ayu. So, uh, my name is Gusti Ayu. Uh, I want to ask, so uh, basically you have a database of frequency, the audio, right? Yeah. Uh, so far, how many uh, database? So my personal, the amount of audio I have, I have about 4,000 hours we've got. But glo but there's, yeah, across the globe, it's, I, I, I can't even imagine. It's enormous, the amount of data we've got. So my, my data I store in about five terabytes. It's not a huge amount, but there's, yeah, way more internationally. Not, not compared to the rest of the, <laughs> not compared to the rest of the world, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay. um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you are in the forest, sometimes you hear noises that you cannot explain. Mm -hmm. Have you have that ever happened to you? <laughs> Do you know, I, I have one. I have a recording of one. So not even just me. I know that it's not in my head. There was in the forest where I live, well, in London, 
it's just normal forest audio and then this really really high pitched almost like mechanically high pitched just like modular signal for like 5 minutes and then it stops and i've never heard it in real life and i it's definitely i don't think it's a, an animal it's too clean to be an animal so it's too clean to be an animal yes and yeah. and you said it's 5 minutes long 5 uh, 5 minute but like oh yeah. okay yeah, so I, I have no idea what that is. I showed it to a few people, no one's really sure. But, yeah. Bit spooky. <laughs> okay. Mungkin kuntilanak gitu kali ya. Because here in, in well, uh, sh she lived in Sabah, yeah? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So she was in, she did her PhD in Malaysia. And, well, you know, in, in I hate to say this, but in in our culture, there's many you know spirits, etc. So sure, maybe you yeah. capture the energy yeah. of the spirits. <laughs> yeah, we'll look out for that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ada pertanyaan lagi? Masih ada lima menit. Kalau ada yang mau. Okay. Kalau belum. Ala. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Aulia Molidia. I'm a first year uh, master student, especially in integrated pest management. Uh, this is very new topic and very interesting for me to learn. Uh, and then the thing I want to ask is, uh, maybe this is a basic question. Uh, the main, uh, what are the main challenges or limitation in using acoustic uh, and machine learning for ecosystem uh, monitoring in special d uh, dimension mm -hmm. and how do you overcome these issues yeah um thank you, thank you. yeah there, there are quite a lot of challenges and one of the like key one is that not all animals make noise um and that by just focusing on sound we lose a huge amount of data particularly there's very little data as well on insects and uh yeah, so we have quite good classifications on, for example, bird noise, gibbon noise, these like big charismatic animals that people like. We've got loads of labeled data on. But when you come down into, yeah, looking at like insects or like flight patterns in wings, there's quite a lot of information there, but no one's labeled it yet. No one's like created those databases. So one of the things we're trying to do, or what we've been looking at recently, actually, we've been trying to develop the classification algorithms, so machine learning algorithms that don't need training data so that are built on sort of separating out clusters more so than like looking for these like labeled features and in that sense we can that open that up to animals where we don't have a lot of labeled data for example we could maybe start detecting like wing beat patterns of insects or deploy them in places where we don't have a load of that labeled data as far as animals that don't make noise i'm not sure what we do about that really and i think the the answer is and what i think i would quite like to do is build a system that uses multiple different monitoring techniques. So you'll have acoustic stuff, we'll have camera traps would also be brilliant. And then sort of perhaps some automation of like pitfall traps or like insect monitoring with that. So we can like try and capture a broad range of stuff, but like have it as an automated system, I think is just a way of like maximizing the amount of data we can get and the kind of conclusions we can draw. But yes, it's, I'd say that's the big thing, trying to capture as many, as much taxa as, as we can do. Okay, thank you. So um, the use of this uh, technology yeah. is actually in addition of the traditional monitoring of capturing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's not to replace, right? It's, uh, or how 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 do you see that? I think at the moment it's in combination with. So yeah, I think at the moment we're still this stuff is all emerging. A lot of people are using it, but it is at the moment we're trying to prove it works and make sure that it. It is, it is we are getting the right conclusions from the data. I think, I'm not sure where the future is going with it. I think I, as ecologists, we're still largely doing a lot of the same experimental processes that we've been doing for, you know, 100 years, say. So I think it is possible. Oops, Ooh, sorry. That's all right. Okay, I'll just go. Or I'm back, yeah. So it is possible that we'll reach a point where people don't need to go into the field at all. And all of the... Uh, experimental effort goes into uh, like analyzing that data or looking at new methods or sending these kind of devices to places that we, we wouldn't be able to access. So at the moment when we monitor ecosystems, we're quite limited by access until we're well aware. So if we could like, get some drones and deploy these sensors in areas that aren't so easy to access, that we then open Do, 
you use the word drone. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, wow, I didn't think about that this before. So you can actually um, put this with the drone and then send the drone to capture whatever noises. Yeah, one day. <laughs> I hope so, one, <laughs> one day. day. <laughs> <But> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. So a lot of people. And it's difficult to find rhinos. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to use this method to capture where rhinos are? I mean, sending drones mm -hmm. and it's possible. I mean, I imagine it would be possible, particularly uh, through sound. Well, I mean, if they make sound, and also through like thermal cameras is another way people are doing it. So you okay. have these ultra high definition thermal cameras that can see sort of through the canopy and get ideas. I suppose the real problem with that is you don't want to make that information publicly accessible. And that, that's something that we're, yeah. particularly with the acoustics as well, we're very conscious of that like, it's a balance between making the data available to everyone and the tech available to everyone. But at the same time, you need to make sure it's not falling into the wrong hands. And how you do that is mm. a challenge, but something we are definitely thinking about. Yeah. Okay, so safety yeah, is mm. another important. Okay, ada pertanyaan lagi? Oh, there's online question. Sorry, uh, can can we read that? There's. Oh, sorry, that's me. Oh, that's you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh. oh, oh no. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> cool. Okay. Okay. You have one more. Uh, the soundscape basically based on the pattern of the frequency, right? Yeah. Exactly. It's not the ampli amplitude. Uh, both. Actually. Oh, both. Yes. So actually, you can make three dimension, not only uh, two dimension of uh, soundscape like yeah. what you saw, but also three dimension. So you you know the distance, for example. So uh, it's funny. We're, that's something else we're working on as well. So okay. okay. <laughs> we're um, so where we've got so in the spectrogram that I showed you, you know the image, mm -hmm. the lightness of the pixel. So the the color of the pixel is all based on um, the amplitude. So you have the frequency and the amplitude is expressed mm. in the uh, uh, in the spectrogram. Oh yeah. So for example, this one. So that where you've got that white bar, that's where you've got high amplitude, big wave receptor. Um, but the problem that we have is that so we know how loud a signal is when it hits the sensor. So we're we're on the when the signal hits the microphone, we can record how loud that is. What this is. But a lot of the time, we actually don't know how loud that signal was when it was emitted from the animal. So what we're one of the things we're trying to work on is building, is categorizing how loud uh, sounds are when they come out of, for example, a bird. So when a bird calls, how loud is it at that point? Zero difference. Yeah. And then you can work out the of those each phase, yeah. and then from that, we'll be able to work out how far away it is. Mm. But at the moment, we don't know how loud it is at that point. So that's actually something else we're looking to do with spatial acoustics for, because if we build a network of spatial acoustics, we can record not only how loud the signal is when it hits the sensor, but we can also work out where that sound has come from and how long away. So then we can sort of go back and approximate how loud it would have been at the point of origin. And so that would be a way of building like a training data set for that exact, basically that exact process. I'm standing here and listening to your explanation. I'm just amazed at uh, the knowledge that um, you have. So <laughs> one, one question, what courses did you have to take to be <laughs> able to? <laughs> yeah, um, what, 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 what type of courses that you, you took I master and PhD to so be where you are now? <laughs> <laughs> my, so my undergrad was super interdisciplinary. So we basically, I got to pick subjects from across the whole university really good for me because at first I wanted 
to study aliens, I was like, right, I need to do astronomy and like biodiversity and whatever. that was my kind of interest. And also art? Did you take art because um, you have design? I no, I didn't take art, but I am, yeah, I'm working with an artist on something else. But that's yeah, that's kind of like, yeah. We um, but I think the big thing, the re the thing that's really carried me is actually the computational methods. So I learned Python and MATLAB and R at university, and then that that's really been where that's been the only thing that's been consistent between all of the jobs that I've done really. Okay. So the turning point is Python. And Python, R. And Python and R, I'd say. Python and R. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Python is a snake, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Jadi untuk bisa untuk bisa sampai ke sini sebenarnya belajar apa sih macam-macam belajar astronomi juga katanya ya. Tapi ternyata katanya yang kunci itu ternyata mem mempelajari R dan Python itu tadi bahasa ya. Jadi itu yang buat lompatan besar dalam karirnya. Nah jadi bagi mahasiswa di sini mungkin kalau yang ingin selama ini ada penasaran dengan R, penasaran dengan Python, go for it ya, karena masa depan ada di situ kayaknya. Ya Pak Pak Pur ya, Anda adalah masa depan, kami adalah masa lalu. <laughs> Oke, okay, ada pertanyaan tentang yang lain, yang santai-santai? Oke, okay. okay. kalau tidak ada, let's give a big applause again to Becky. Thank you so much, Becky. Thank you so much for being here. And there's a certificate from the department. Thank you. <laughs> Oke, okay, makasih sudah hadir and thank you for the one and uh, the people at Zoom and also in, in uh, YouTube. Thank you so much. We've uh, heard, heard a very wonderful um, presentation today, learning a lot about um, how to use bioacoustic and also monitoring. Usually when we say monitoring, it's, it's really we, we count, we see, and now it's we listen. So that's really an additional uh, technology that we need to learn. So. Once again, thank you for coming and thank you so much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Tick, tick.